So today I'm making the um, the inner gunnels, uh, inner and outer gunnels for the canoe. I don't know if it's going to work out because I'm not really happy with the material. Uh, but I had a couple questions about the crooked knife and I, that I didn't demonstrate it well enough. Well, essentially what it is, it's a, it's a one-handed draw knife basically with the added bonus of having this radius at the end. So that can be used to put radiuses on. So for my gunnel caps, I'm going to want a radius where the roots go over instead of a sharp edge. So it works really good for giving me that nice, perfectly round um, radius on my, on my gunnel pieces. Uh, it was used as a gouge for bowl making or noggin making, if you would. So yeah, the Mogatoggin, amazing tool that uh, I absolutely love using. Anyway, I've got these two done. And like I say, I'm not very happy with them, but I'm gonna start working on my uh, inner gunnels now. Ah. Okay, so that's back to the drawing board. Um, one of the trickier parts to make on the canoe is the inner gunnel because it's, um, as you can see, it's, qu it's quite thin. So I'm looking to make a piece that's a, a quarter of an inch wide by one inch this way. So when you're starting from a, a, a full log, splitting it down, working it down, so and this, on this guy, I've probably got about mm, two to three hours of work. <laughs> anyway, what I've produced is a whole lot of kindling. Yeah, but it, it'll go to use. It's going to start some fires. Um, I may be able to use it actually for the battens along the side of the canoe when I start sewing the bark, because that keep makes sure my bark gives me a nice line. So I, I won't throw them away just yet. But yeah, that some might say that's some wasted time. But when you're surrounded by Mother Nature and the spring migratory birds singing, it really isn't a waste of time, but I'm not happy with the outer gunnels I made either. They, I did get them whittled out, but they got some weak spots. So I think I'm going to trash them all and I'm going to go off to the bush and see if I can find some better material because there's no sense putting this kind of effort into an inferior product. Yeah, you know what? They're, they're, they're all going over here into, hopefully I can find another use for them because the bottom line, they just don't have enough integrity. Um, what, what I've tried to do here is work around the knots. So, so this piece has got a number of them and I sort of try to keep one knot on the high side here and this knot on the low side here and work around it. But what I've got is, and this is a really bad area, because I've got to split these down to give me that bend at, at the bow and stern of the canoe. So anyway, <laughs> instead of two and a half or three hours of labor, I've got, if I look down at this pile and all these pieces that I split out uh, earlier this spring, I, I'm to the point where I'm thinking none of them are any good. So uh, yeah, it's back to the bush and uh, see what I can come up with. There, that's the last of them. And I have actually found the perfect tree. Um, if one looks from the bottom to the top, we don't have a single, single knot in this. Um, there may be a small one down at that end that I certainly can work around, but I've been at this for a while and I've never found pieces quite this good. So I brought out four. I've got some, uh, the heart that I can possibly use, but these four pieces are gonna give me the six pieces I need. So again, I got to start splitting and work them out, but I've got to get two inner gunnels, roughly an inch square, two outer, outer gunnels, a uh, quarter of an inch by an inch, and then the two um, gunnel caps that go on after the canoe's all laced. Anyway, I'm, I'm really, really tickled pink, as my mother would say, with those pieces. We'll let them dry for a day or two before I get at them.
Okay, so I'm just uh, finishing up some of the last sheathing for the canoe build, back into that manufacturing of parts. Anyway, thought I'd tell a wee story, so a wee bit of history today. And uh, an era that really fascinates me is the Mountain Man era. So if we think of 1800s to 1840s, and there's some real characters, some infamous people there. We've got uh, Fitzpatrick, we've got Bridger, um, we've got John, John, but one that stand, really stands out is John Coulter. And, and his famous escape from the, from the Blackfoot Nation, because very, very few people in that era, if you were captured by the natives, the chances of, of getting away were sl slim or none. Uh, anyway, he's forced to make a run. They've stripped him naked. He's forced to make a run. He makes his way all the way to uh, Jefferson Forks, and then this day, takes him like days and days and days, and, and he's always ahead of him. And he finally finds a spot where he hides under a tangle of brush in a, in a river, and eventually he makes his escape, and he gets back to Fort Lisa. So, so we think about th those people and, and, and the stories they tell, but back here in the east, because I live in the eastern part of the continent, we, we have our mountain men too, but, but we didn't call them mountain men. They were called frontiersmen. Anyway, I think I'm going to grab Jenny, because this story is so good, it's going to, I think it'll come across a bit better if I'm holding a musket in my hand. So, <laughs> do allow me to set the stage. If we think back to uh, the late 1700s, extremely turbulent time in the Americas, um, and the people on the frontier, they dressed like natives, they were often mistaken as natives, they hunted like them, they trapped, they, um, and, and that's the type of hardy breed of people that were out there. So my story actually takes place 30 years before, uh, before John Coulter's, um, and, and so it's, it's our version of a mountain man, if you would, even though we'll call him a frontiersman. So the fellow I'm going to talk about, his name is, uh, his name is Captain Samuel Brady. Now, and, and as I mentioned, rarely did anyone captured escape uh, once captured by the natives. And especially if one had, um, uh, was known to them, if they knew, knew a person by name, like Daniel Boone, like Simon Kenton, if they knew you by name, you were on their list of condemned men. And, and it was quite a coup to capture them. So my story starts in October 1781. And this Captain Samuel Brady, he's out reconnoitering with um, a, a group of men called um, Brady's Rangers. And, and their primary job was to try to locate uh, imminent danger from natives and report back to the settlements. But his commanding officers also gave him the, the license, if you would, that if he felt it prudent to attack, he should. So Brady's out with his group of 40 men and, and they come across a group of a little over 60 warriors. And they're painted up, they got their tomahawks painted red, they're, they're ready for war. So being rather aggressive aside, he's outnumbered. He's got 40 men, they got 60 plus. He, um, he decides to, uh, to attack. <laughs> So he takes, his, he takes his 40 men and he, puts, uh, he, he takes 12 with him. He puts the remaining ones in a, in a valley with half of them on either side on the hills. He approaches the native camp at night. Now as dawn breaks, the natives are, are starting to have breakfast. They're preparing for breakfast. So they're, they're all around the fire. Now Brady snuck up in the dark and he's got 12 men with him. And they're 50 yards away. And at his command, they fire, and, and instantly 10, 10 natives go down wounded or, or injured. And they hightail it. They, they, got, they know the, the, what will happen if they're caught. So they're hightailing it back to the ambush. The natives only see 12 of them, so they think, well, yeah, let's just chase. And they're, they're a little peeved, so they chase after them. And Brady leads them right down into this valley with his waiting men on either side. As soon as he's clear of his men, he orders his men to turn. They take a knee. Uh, and he, I can just hear him going, steady boys, steady. And he waits till they're 50 yards away and he orders them to fire. One can imagine with 40 musket balls being fired almost, uh, almost simultaneously at these poor natives that are down in this valley that it, it was devastating to the war party. So Brady had prior to the ambush had told his men, once the ambush takes place, he says, I want everyone to disperse. I don't want to see a group bigger than two. Everybody goes back and we have a rendezvous spot that we'll meet at. Well, ironically, the only person captured that day is, is Captain Samuel Brady. So he's wading waist deep across a, a creek and he's, he's approached by five Wyandotte uh, hunters. They're, they're not part of the war party, but they'd heard what had happened in the morning. Anyway, he, he knows it's futile to, to, to fight, so he, he's taken captive. And they take him back to the original campsite that he'd attacked that morning. 
Now, these Indians are more than a little bit angry. I mean, they are infuriated with this man. But they're also elated that they've, they've captured the infamous Captain Samuel Brady. And so they take them back to their, their main camp, and, and they're trying to decide what to do. And they decide that like, tor torture was the way they killed the famous ones, a slow burn at the stake uh, method to kill their enemy. And it was decided to do that, but they thought, this is, this is too famous a guy to waste on just a handful of us. So they decide to march him 100 miles back to the upper San Sandusky area, where their main, main encampment is. Uh, so they decide in the morning, they, they tie him up, and in the morning they're going to make him run the gauntlet. And, and then after that they're going to march him with a, a, a prisoner strap around his neck 100 miles to be burned at the stake. So Simon, e, er, Simon sorry, uh, Samuel, he's not going to give up that easy. So morning comes, and they've lined up the two rows for the gauntlet. And in a lot of cases they were killed just trying to run that. They beat at him with sticks and stones and whips and tomahawks and... Anyway, a brave approaches him and orders, orders Brady to strip. Well, Brady's not going to strip. He's going to have no part of that. So this warrior approaches him and tries to tear his hunting shirt off him. So, so Brady slugs him right between the eyes, drops him down. He picks a baby out of the arms of a woman close by and throws the baby into a fire. Now, in today's world, we can't fathom such br brutality. But in the late 1700s in America, it was a brutal time. Anyway, in the confusion... Uh, 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 the, the baby screaming and the, the trying to capture it, Brady gets a few seconds head start and he starts to run. Now he has, he, he has no accoutrements with him. He has no musket, no guns. And, and, he, and, he, and, he's, and he knows that once he's captured, this is not going to go well for him. So I, I guess all of us have had times in our lives where, where we're frightened, but I can't, I can't for the life of me get my head inside Brady as he's running away from these pursuing natives. So as, as, as Brady's running away, he, he keeps the Cuyahoga River on his right-hand side because he's been all through this area and he knows it quite well. And he knows there's a place where this quite turbulent river narrows down into this gorge and it's only 22 feet across. So he's running, natives are right behind him, and he knows he has to jump. If, if, he, doesn't, if he doesn't jump, well, he, he knows the repercussions. So with all his might, he lunges himself across this gorge. Now, he, he doesn't quite make the top on the other side. He lands about five feet down on the shelf. And I, I can't fathom That's the longest long jump in the world. But he lands in this shelf. Now, the impact of the hit almost knocks him back into the river. But he's able to maintain his balance. And he's five feet from the crest on the other side. And he makes his way up. Just as he makes his way over the crest, the natives arrive, and they're shooting at him. Well, he takes a bullet through his upper thigh. It cuts a big gouge right through his meat in his upper, upper thigh. Now, he knows he's gained some time because none of these natives, they're going, they're looking at it, they're shaking their heads. Damn fool, jump that thing. And, and none of them are going to try it. Uh, so they split up. Some go upstream, some go downstream, but they're trying to find fording spots where they can get across the river and then pursue and then pursue him. And they know he's hit now. And Brady also knows that now he's bleeding on land, he's going to be an easy thing to track. And, but he's gained a few minutes. It's going to take them a while to get across to his side. So he starts limping across and he realizes he comes to this lake and, and he dives into the lake knowing that if he swims at this point, they won't be able to track him. But he knows they're going to see him at some point. They're going to arrive in the lake. They're going to see him. Well, he finds a down tree, and the top of the tree is in, in, the, in the water. It's a big old chestnut tree. So he dives underneath it, thinking he'll just have to come up back up and down for air periodically. But he finds it's hollowed out. It's, it's rotten inside. So he works his body into it. He climbs up into it, and he finds he's able to just get his head above the water level. <laughs> so he's up inside this hollow thing with his feet down in the water and his head stuck up in this little space of air. So the Indians arrive, and, and they search, and they search, and they search, and they're looking for sign of blood. They go completely around this big lake, can't find him. They're watching for movement, and at one point, one native actually walks down the log that uh, Brady's lying underneath now. <laughs> Talk about fear. Uh, yeah, well, I can't, I, I simply can't relate. Anyway, they finally give up, and, and their rationale is he's dead because they're thinking he's such a brave man that he, he's drowned himself. He's drowned himself rather than let his scalp be taken, which would be an honorable thing that a native would do. So they disperse. Well, <laughs> Brady, he stays right there till dark. 
and, and a wee bit after because he, he's not going to take any chances. Anyway, he crawls out from underneath this log, he swims to shore, and he, and he makes his way to the rendezvous where his men are waiting. And, and the rest is history. I mean, Samuel Brady joins the ranks of uh, the very few infamous frontiersmen. So I won't call them mountain men. Now I'll call them what they were called then. These infamous frontiersmen like Daniel Boone, like uh, Simon Kenton, uh, he, he joins their ranks. And uh, yeah, turbulent time. Anyway, I, I talk a wee bit too much on history sometimes. And I don't get much canoe building done, so I'm back at it. Mm -hmm.